OK, so um, what we're going to look at today is a little bit more about early multi-track recording. So as you remember, last week we looked at four track recording and the seminal album, 1967 album that was Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, right, done by the Beatles. Around the same time, another band were out, another guy was out called Jimi Hendrix. Now, hands up anyone who's heard of Jimi Hendrix. So there's a few of you, right? Well, Jimi Hendrix was a uh, a guitar player. He essentially was probably one of the best guitar players of the time, if not of all time. And uh, he had a very unique style. And as um, B.B. King said, he's, he's the only cat that could play psychedelic. And uh, he was incredibly talented. And he came over to England from America and he actually broke England before he broke America. And uh, he he created a band, or he was made to create a band through his record company called the Jimi Hendrix Experience, which was basically a three-piece. It was Jimi Hendrix, Mitch Mitchell on drums, and Noel Redding on bass guitar. And the three of them did this album called Are You Experienced? And one of the tracks on that album was called The Wind C Cries Mary. And uh, it ha it's a really good example of his amazing ability to create songs like that but also um of early eight track recording so we'd gone from four track right at the beginning of 1967 and we'd managed to get it up to eight track by the end of 1967 so this album was done actually done on an eight track machine um so first of all, what we do is we're just going to get a little bit of this of the sense of the track and how it was created by we're going to show the, I'm going to show you this little video and then we're going to look at the multi track and just basically dissect dissect it a little bit and see what kind of technology was used and what techniques were used to create it. OK, so let's just start by watching this video. Um, so basically it was done on the shoestring. And it was done in the in the world where you had limited, very limited time in a recording studio. And it really, again, like I say, it really shows um, Jimi Hendrix's kind of ability to really uh, pull things out of the bag really quickly. Um, so look, here's the multi-track that we've I've managed to get hold of, and uh, we're just going to go through it bit by bit. You'll notice first off that there are six tracks. I can't. I was trying to figure out why there are only six tracks when it was done on an eight track. And all I can think of is maybe what they did was they bounced some stuff down. Um, do we know what bounced means? When I say bounced. Can somebody, ex yeah. can somebody explain it? Or... Yeah, that'd be great. If somebody could explain what bouncing means. When I say bouncing what tracks. Does, what does bouncing mean? Let's choose somebody at random. Okay, well, I you do Le that. You do it. <laughs> Layla, you know what bouncing means? When you turn it into an MP3 or something? No, no. Well, in in common in modern parlance, yeah, that's right. That we bounce something down to disc. But back then, what that meant was, say you had a four track, right, and you'd recorded on three of those tracks, and you only had one track left but you still had to record more than one thing, what you would do is you would bounce those three tracks together onto one track, right? You could then record over those three tracks that you bounced from. However, what that meant was, one, you would lose a lot of quality in that because every time you bounce something, you lose a generation of quality. And two, you wouldn't be able to do any changes in levels on that track because it had been pre-mixed. OK, so it was a very it was a massive limitation of the time. And uh, that's why you've got sometimes you've got think lots of things on the same track. So if we listen to this one, let's just listen to the whole thing for a start. Let's make sure you can hear it. All that let's just take it apart let's have a listen to the first track here right right that what's that 
What is that? Because <laughs> anyone likes to hazard a guess as to what kind of instrument that is. <laughs> anyone? What's it sound like, Amy? Drum? Yeah, it's a kick drum. Okay, and uh, there's something, an effect has been used on it um, called a gate, a noise gate. Has everyone heard of what a noise gate is? No? You used a noise. Yeah. You've used a noise gate before with Mr. Hanson, haven't you? Yeah. You've yeah, seen... they've used one before. Yeah, so what a noise gate does is it cuts out any sound below a certain level or, or um, threshold. So you can hear here, there's no sound between the kick drums. There's no bleed through, okay? Whereas if I listen to this one, and it's the same, that's a snare and that's a kick drum. So these are two tracks. Right, it sounds really weird, right? Because you have to hear it in context with the third track, this one. I mean, this is really weird. It's got a bit of gating on it as well. But you put the three together. It kind of work. Really strange. And this is all to do with the way, the limitations that they had of recording drums, i.e. not enough tracks. Right, so there's the drums, right? And that carries on. Now this would have had reverb put on it, okay? Now the time at the time, reverb would have been you would have had two options with reverb, um, or three options with reverb um, at the time. One option would be you wouldn't use it; you would just record it in a room, right? And that you would use the reverb of the room, okay? So that would just be the natural environment that you'd record it into. So if you wanted it to sound like it was in a hall, you'd record it in a hall. If you wanted to make it sound like it was record, it was in a bathroom, guess where you'd record it? In a bathroom, right? So that was one, that was one uh, way in which they did it. Another way they used to do it, which was a very expensive way, was where they actually had a reverb room, where you would have a room which you'd have a speaker at one end and a microphone at the other. And so essentially when the sound was played through the speaker from the studio, like say a vocal, for example, it would come out of the speaker, go into this room, which would have a reverb effect because it'd be quite large. And then there would be a microphone at the other end of the room to pick up the reverb, which they would then pipe back to the studio. So that was really expensive because you had to have a special room just for your reverb, okay? So what they used to do was they used to use a type of reverb called a plate reverb. Now, you will need to know this. This is very important, and this is a bit of information that Edexcel w will expect you to know in an exam. Plate reverb. And as the name suggests, it was a massive plate, a big metal plate. And what would happen is you would input the sound as an electrical current. So it would be go from the sound into the microphone. The microphone would then essentially be plugged into the metal plate. The metal plate would vibrate because of the input electricity, right? And it would vibrate in such a way as to create a reverb effect, a plate reverb effect. So we'll look into that a little bit more detail at a later date. But just to, to suffice to know is, like, if something was recorded in the 60s, the chances are it would have used a plate reverb. OK, so let's just carry on then. Um, let's go on to the next next track. What have we got Can here? I just, sorry, yeah. sorry to stop you there. There's a few things that I've written on the board just to, for you folks at this time. And I'll just go through them. Um, okay. These are the things that I think from so far what you should note down. Uh, so the term bounce. Yeah. So to reduce multiple tracks together to one track, freeing up another track That's or correct. other tracks. Yes. The pros are that you get more free tracks, yes. but the cons are you can't edit those tracks and you also use lose quality yes. because it's a new generation. Exactly. Yes. Um, and then the term generation, meaning yeah. like each time you do that, each time you bounce multiple tracks to a new track. 
yeah. you're going to get more hits. You're, you're going to get yeah. lower quality. So it's called first generation copy, a second generation copy, third generation copy. They would gradually get worse as you go up, go through the generations. Yeah. And so, uh, you can really hear that, just to interject, sorry. You can really hear yeah. that on the old Motown records. Uh, what they used to do is they used to record the drums first. That would get bounced down, right? And then... Then it would get, but might get bounced down again with something else, say with the bass guitar, right? So you'd lose, you'd have second generation uh, drums and first generation bass, and then that might get bounced down again with a guitar. So by that point, the 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 the, the drums are actually at third generation, and you can barely hear them. So in order to get round that, what they did was they used to add a tambourine. Now, if you listen to loads of uh, Motown records from that era, you'll notice how loud the tambourine is. And that's because that was the last thing that they put on the track, on the on the multi-track, to give the timing. So there you go. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, and then the other thing that I think you should note, Dan, is this top right-hand corner that I've written down, which is the options in the 60s for reverb, number one, was actually do it in a room that had the type of reverb you wanted. Yeah. Um, another option is to have a reverb room in the studio, which is expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Thor has explained that clearly. I've drawn a little picture of it that you might want to copy down and just add some notes to. And then plate reverb, which is essentially a metal plate vibrates to create a reverb effect. That's correct. That's something that maybe you can do some research on in a little more, bit more detail independently. How does plate reverb actually work? That's um, one, and yeah. could look up some videos for that. But if you have those things noted down, I would say so far you've kept up with what you need to know. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. That's fine. That's fine. So let's carry on with this next track. So this is the uh, guitar track. You can hear there's a lot of hiss on there. And you can just hear in the background a tiny vocal. So this is two things. These are two things that, uh, that we need to know about here. One of them is where the hiss comes from. Now the hiss is because of the recording medium that they use, which is tape tape inherently has hiss in it um so uh there was we could talk a little bit how we used to reduce that hiss but essentially it's something that was just part of the recording and the other thing that is um evident there is bleed through so essentially that happens when you get when you're recording more than one thing at a time using microphones you're going to get a little bit of the thing that you don't want to record on the microphone you want to that is recording so you can just hear in the background the vocal yeah now if i just we've just transfer to the vocal track you can hear in the background you can hear happiness the opposite staggering on down the street footprints dressed in red so this is interesting because in that video, I don't think he actually knew what he was talking about. <laughs> because what's happening here is essentially this was done as a live recording. So this vocal, he did this vocal whilst he was doing that guitar part. OK, that's how good a musician he was. And he was probably in the room where you do the recording. He had screens around him and he was it had the vocal microphone. And, the, and, wear, and wearing the guitar. So you can hear the guitar acoustically coming up on the vocal mic. And then he had a long lead from his guitar going to his guitar amp, which was probably a few feet away. And there was a microphone on that, but because his voice is quite loud, it, that microphone was also picking up his voice as well as his guitar. So we've got both of them together. But fortunately, because he's so amazing, he didn't need to do any overdubs or anything like that. Um, they're completely in sync with each other. And actually, you could argue, add something to the recording. They add a space, which is hard to replicate. They add a uniqueness, which is hard to replicate. And it's something which modern recordings sadly lack these days. In a lot of ways, they're so clinically produced that a lot of these things, you don't, you don't get them anymore. You don't get these problems anymore. 
Um, so, just could we just pick up on the word overdub that you used? Can yes. you very briefly explain that? Okay, so an overdub is when you record something else over the recording you've already done. So it's not just a live recording, but then you may overdub, uh, say, a lead guitar. And I'm going to show you an example of an overdub right now. So that's a good little interjection there. So, so if we just listen to this bit here, um, we just, I've just soloed out the guitar. <laughs> Yeah, there's a few things happening there. So I just play it again. Would you like to hear that again? So you can hear the difference. He's playing this guitar. Right? And then you can hear there's a little record change. There. The tone of guitar changes, the guitar sound changes, and it gets louder. Okay? So that is what's known as an overdub, but it's also, because we're lacking in tracks, it's called a punch in as well because you've recorded on the same track that you've recorded something else right so you're punching in on an existing track and overdubbing a guitar solo okay so that's probably quite a complex thing but we'll go through it a little bit more so here we've got we've got the vocal Mary. we can hear that something else happens different guitar part so he's recorded it on the vocal track because he hasn't got any other tracks to record onto and he's not singing so he can use this track so this works with this part so we've got what's happened to me it sounds like this guitar right yeah the the rhythm guitar part if you like carries on on the vocal bit so it's like he's they've recorded they've re-recorded the uh the the rhythm guitar on the vocal track and then they've recorded the lead guitar into the rhythm track i have no idea why they've done that but there must be some kind of technical reason why they did that, or maybe they just they maybe they did made a mistake, and maybe they deleted something by accident, and they had to re-record it. They had to re-record the uh, the, um, the the rhythm track. So just to reiterate, this is an overdub, yeah, because they've added something extra over the live recording, and it's a punch in because they haven't got enough tracks to put it on a separate track. Okay. To just very quickly, so there's three things that you should note down. So bleed through when an unwanted sound source is audible on another track. So yes. e.g. the vocal is slightly audible on the guitar track. Yeah, and vice um, make sure you, Yeah, make sure you've got that noted down. Um, this, as Thor said, this creates a sort of like sound of the time as well. He was saying that it's not really audible. That's in right. current like modern recordings it doesn't right. happen so it does create a sort of a a feeling a soul of the sound that's right um the hiss the tape inherently has hiss tape as a medium yeah inherently has hiss yeah um overdub when you record something else over something you've already recorded or also as a, uh, also known as punch in and on this you can hear it because the volume is louder the tone of the guitar changes yeah. and it's on the same track and you can actually kind of see it on the waveform you can. You, can. you can see that this here looks bigger it looks the peaks are higher and it looks different um so perhaps the guitars when they've recorded that they've moved slightly close to the microphone with the guitar or something has it happened. changed the tone on the guitar 
he basically he probably right. flicked he used he used a strat and if anyone who knows is a guitarist they will know you've got a dial which you can change which pickup you use so he probably just whacked it onto the back pickup to give himself a bit more bite in the guitar a bit more level right. on the humbucker one thing can you add a little bit of detail? You mentioned, so tape inherently has hiss. Is there any way at this time that they reduced the hiss or could they, reduce the hiss? They did, yes. They're a Dolby. Has anyone heard of Dolby? Yeah, well, Dolby uh, came about as a noise reduction system. So that would li essentially, they would use some clever um, circuitry to reduce the amount of hiss. However, it did have a problem of making... Uh, mixes sound a bit dull because it took away a lot of the top end you take away hiss you also take away the high end so uh dolby would reduce it wouldn't make mixes sound as bright so it was used sparingly you might use it on some instruments but not on others so uh let's just carry on so the final part in this is the And it shows basically the kind of next stage uh, above a live recording, essentially. The the use of overdubs, the use of punch-ins, the use of gates. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. So uh, it's this file is in the um, shared space. So you can go and have a look at it. And I would imagine it'd be quite useful to have a go at just trying to mix it. Just have a look at mixing it. So by mixing it, I mean, maybe put a touch of reverb on there. So, for example, on the vocal, if we go to the vocal here and I would I would just set up a bus. So you set up a bus, auxiliary bus, which is a separate channel, right, which then I can send a part of this signal, this vocal. If I just, I'll just set a loop up here. Footprints dressed in real okay so i'm going to now that i've created this track you can see i've got bus one here okay so if i click in here i can now put in a reverb i think the best reverbs are the space designer reverbs and if we go to the browser or we go to here we go let's say large space and look we've got plate reverbs and look one of them is called vocal plate well that's convenient i think i might use that one so there we go, we put in the vocal plate and then we have to send a little bit of the signal to it. Footprints dressed in red. And there we go. And the wind whispers merry. And now we can experiment with a few different types of vocal plate. Let's try another one. Let's try let's try a big choir, big plate. 4.4 seconds. That's a very long plate. But uh, just to give you an idea of the variations. Footprints dressed in red. Now the problem with that is it lasts for ages. You hear when I press stop, it was still going. Footprints. So does anyone hazard a guess as to why that would be a problem? Yeah, go on. Makes it muddy. Exactly. Cuts away makes it, it it takes away from it just fills up loads of space so if i put this in with everything else it sounds like he's down a well you know it, <laughs> it's like we, it, it loses presence 
So the length of the reverb is actually quite key. So let's just put that back to a vocal plate, which is 2.6 seconds, which again is still quite long. And you'll notice it's almost like you can't hear it. Footprints dressed in red. So that's why it's um, one of the things that um, new engineers tend to do when they're starting to learn is put just put loads of reverb on it because they can't hear it. But it does, even though you can't hear it, it's almost like you can hear it. So there are other things you could do to it to make it sound more prominent. For example, you could put an EQ on it. So here's the space design it in the bus if i press double click on the eq it puts an eq into the channel afterwards this this order matters right so it's now you've got your space designer and then that is going into an eq right and what i'll do just as i'm just going to boost frequencies here in the middle and i'm going to cut these frequencies at the bottom and at the very top so if we just hear that footprints dressed in red Okay, and I'll turn that off. This is without it. Footprints dressed in red. And with it. Footprints dressed in red. Can you hear the difference? Just put your thumb, go like that if you, if you can hear the difference. Yeah, okay. So that's, I mean, the thing about mixing is it's, there's a lot of subtleties involved, okay? So the subtleties add up as well so you do lots and lots of little changes lots and lots of little things that on their own maybe don't they're not game changers right but it's these little things little things that you do lots and lots of them which basically create a mix so the task is to have a look at this track and have a go at mixing it yourself uh, i would listen to the original which is on youtube um I haven't got the, I, I could probably put the original, I'll put the original in as well. And you'll notice there's some ex, there's some serious panning that they use, which is a very 60s thing. Like the drums are all on the right. Um, the bass is on the left, I think. And the vocals on the left anyway. But you'll, you'll hear what I mean if you listen to the original. So that's the can task. I, yep. Can I ask a few questions that you might want to note down the answers to? Um, so firstly, with reverb on the vocals, yeah. if you're mixing something, yeah. um, when you put reverb on one track, you're making that one track sound like it's in a space, like the vocals are in a space. Yes. Do you want to do the same thing to all the tracks? If you decide to put reverb on the vocals, should you also put reverb on the other tracks? Um, not necessarily. So tracks that normally don't have reverb would be the bass because you want the bass up front um, if we listen to this guitar that could probably do with a little bit of reverb on it because he hasn't put reverb on with the amp okay I'm not even sure you did have reverb on amps then to be fair um, this one Well, that's just an incredibly weird track, right? That's got gating in it. But you know what's going on here, actually? This is um, this is the, a kind of a, this is a an example of side chaining um, a gate to another instrument. So you'll notice that it drops out there, 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 right? It's it's dropping out on every one of these, right? So whenever the so the overheads are being gated by the snare. So that's got natural reverb. You can hear that. You can hear that the snare reverb is on the other track. So like here, there's no reverb. Yeah, you can't hear it. Right. But if you have it with the overhead track, you can hear it. that look dying away does everyone hear that yeah. yeah because that is quite subtle that is quite a subtle effect okay but that's a very rare thing what's done what she's done there maybe we should bring it back guys 
Maybe we should bring back gating your overheads. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do so it. So <laughs> generally, generally no reverb on bass. Is there any other instruments that don't um, have it as commonly? Um, you don't normally put it on the kick drum or basically any bass instruments. Normally you want them up front. So you normally don't have them. Uh, don't have reverb on those. Vocals invariably do. Guitars usually have a little bit strings things like that uh saxophones horns things like that would have reverb um so yeah next week we can look at we'll look at a more complex multi-track if um and the drums the drums will have some reverb. snare, on it. snare will have reverb on it um and the toms will have reverb on it and maybe a little on your overheads but it depends it depends it's it depends where you've recorded the drums as well yeah you know there's no hard or fast rules essentially this is what this is what mixing is about it's about making these aesthetic decisions about what makes a good um, mix. and i have two more things to ask of you if that's okay sure so firstly it sounds like so with mixing um phil was talking about when people start they whack a load of reverb on because it's audible and because you can hear it and it, it kind of like it seems that partially what you need to do is understand how to use the functions that you're using to mix. And then the second part is how to develop, you're basically trying to develop good taste yes. in mixing. Yes. Like doing things that will add up to make a, a, a track that sounds the best it can, Yeah. but without yeah. like overdoing certain things. Like you don't want, even if the reverb, you know, you whack a load of reverb on and it sounds audible, does that, in the end really add to the mix exactly. and if it doesn't you need to use it you need to use it tastefully yes. rather than audibly absolutely and it comes back to the main skill which engineers and producers have which is critical listening uh, which is the skill that all of us need to learn and continue to learn through our careers as music technologists or music technology or music producers uh, it's the ability to listen to a piece of music and deconstruct it and try and figure out what on earth is going on with that track. And uh, if you can do that, that is, and we do that through referencing. We do that by listening to music that we like, listening to music that has been professionally recorded and deconstructing it, taking it apart bit by bit and trying to figure out how they did it. Um, that is, the and, and, and critically listening to it, whether it's effective or not, what they've done. And that is the number one and then, skill. And then the last thing that I was going to maybe ask you to do is if you feel like you are comfortable and confident to go and have a go at that and um, listen to that track and try to mix it, or if you've started on the other tutorials that Thor put up on the shared area and you will work on those, which I know some of you were, you could do that instead. So work on something that is mixing one of the tasks you have. The the only thing I would was maybe going to ask if you have another 10 sort of minutes is if you are not comfortable with using a bus or you don't know how to do that, or what it does, would you be able to just show them that again in slight, slightly slowed down pace? Um, if you go to my website and you yeah. go to the free tutorials, there's a bit on how to use auxiliary buses, but so oh, okay yeah it's pretty straightforward but uh, i'll just okay. show you i mean i can show you again if you like but it's it, I, um just one second sorry who put who would want to see how to use a bus put your hand up one two three four five do you mind just quickly showing them if they sure. come to the front and everybody else can get started then so if you come sh scooch yourselves a bit more forward so you can see a bit better and then everybody else can get started okay so let's just get this vocal right so we've got this vocal here footprints dressed in and we want to create a reverb on it using a bus now a bus or auxiliary is a spare track if you like auxiliary means spare okay so uh what we what we do as soon as we create a bus uh like bus one right aux one say i'll go bus two because we've already done it on bus one right it, it creates a new track here aux two 
yeah? And I can name that, and I can say this is going to be vox verb, okay? All right? And now, so what um, that means... Just yeah. one second, sorry. So it doesn't actually create a new track in your upper window here. It creates a new track in your mixer. It does, you. yeah. So to open the mixer, do you know how to open the mixer? But you don't need to go to the mixer to find that auxiliary. Do you not? No, you can go to the track inspector here. You see these channels, the oh. channel strip here. So if I once I've created a mix, a, a bus, there, right? You can see that this track next to me, the channel here, is called bus two. So it automatically puts it next to it, right? So if I if I say so if I click on stereo here, right? It's it, this track now is the stereo track, the stereo output. Okay. If I click on the bus, this track is now bus two. Okay, is that clear? Say that one more time. Okay, so say I wanted, say if I put click on the stereo out here, right? This channel here, this track here, this has changed to the stereo outlet. Yeah? yeah. If I click on the bus, it's changed to bus two. So whichever one I it click on here, the the track next to it, the channel strip next to it, will change to that one. So if I say, right, if I'm going, right, I want a new bus, and I go bus three now, right, this is created, this is changed to bus three. So then I can put okay. my reverb in there, you see. So you don't need to bring up, I don't know why I've done that, you don't need to bring up the mixer necessarily, okay? You can yep. just do it all in this little bit here. So well, this is one of the things with Logic, right? There is at least three things to do every single thing. <laughs> There's diff at least three ways to do every different every different task you want to do, okay? Because it's such a big program. So anyway, so so say you've like we've created bus three, then we put in a reverb. So I'll just put in another reverb, put in the chroma verb just for variation. And we want a plate reverb. So we'll go to a chamber let's have a look spaces no this one doesn't actually have plates in it does it so i'll go to i'm going to just go back to the other one uh which is the best one anyway and then say large space plate reverbs medium space there's even got plate reverbs in here um small they've even got plates in here so these are all very you can, I mean, let's try a small plate just for variation okay we'll try a bright plate 0.8 of a second so now if i press play Footprints. It's not working, right? Because I have to send some signal to that bus, to that auxiliary bus. So turn that up. Footprints dressed in red. There you go. There it is. And the wind. How did you? Where did you send that? I just this little dial here. That's sending a copy of this vocal track to bus three. It's, this is my level that I'm sending it, which is going Can you to see button. that word? Yeah, bus three, That's which is the yeah, sending it to this space designer reverb. And that's it. That's how you use an auxiliary bus. Uh, one, one last question. Why would you use a bus and not just put the reverb on the track? Ah, right. Well, say you've got more than one. Well, originally it's because reverb units were really, really expensive and you would have to do it in the studio you'd have to patch in patch it in and you'd use an auxiliary to be able to do that nowadays obviously we could put like 30 reverbs on in each track if we wanted right uh however if say we wanted if say we had three vocal tracks for example and we wanted them all to sound like they were coming out of the same space then we would set up one reverb and then we on those three tracks we would all send those three tracks to the same reverb to create it the same space so it's good it's good practice because also you have it sounds slightly different as well because you've got your direct sound which is just the, without the reverb and then you've got your reverb sound and i can do stuff to this reverb sound such as put eq on it and it won't eq the original sound it'll just eq the reverb does that make sense? So have, has anybody ever tried to put like that maybe you've had a few tracks of the same instrument and then you put reverb on one of them and they think, oh, but now I want reverb the same on it on all of these tracks. Has that happened to you? 
So this is a way to actually make that a lot easier because you can send multiple tracks to the same bus. You can set up a bus with the reverb on and the levels that you want it. And then you can send multiple tracks to that same bus and they will have the same reverb. Make sense? So you could have a go. That would be a good thing for you to have a go at doing in the last. Well, we actually only have six five minutes. minutes left. So what you could do in six minutes is you could do a quick research into plate reverb. See if yeah. you what you can find out about plate reverb. And then tomorrow you can have a go at practicing using buses. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you.